Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping educational program. I am here today um, to celebrate something very special, the 30th anniversary of Florida Friendly Landscaping. And joining me is Dr. Bill Lester from the University of Florida Hernando or Extension at Hernando County. Welcome, Dr. Lester. Thank you. Good morning, Lily. Good morning. And many of the classes that I teach, that we teach, go over one or more of these principles. Today, we're going to kind of wrap them all up and, and help you be able to pledge to go Florida friendly. And there's an actual process involved, an actual organized pledging process that the University of Florida has organized. It's not hard. Don't worry about it. Um, to um, So everyone can be excited to go Florida friendly. And we're going to go through that whole process. I am Lily Browning. I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator for Hernando County Utilities here in sunny, warm Hernando <laughs> County, Florida. Uh, the best email to use to reach Florida Friendly Landscaping will be this very long one, Hernando County FFL at hernandocounty.us. And Dr. Lester, um, he has a nice short email, wlester at ufl.edu. That is the best way to reach him because he's kind of a mobile kind of a horticulture agent. I'm all um, over the place. He's all over the place. I tell him that all the time. But um, um, and that, you know, his email always follows him. So if you have any, as we always say, they're really hard questions, that is the one to turn to and he can get you in the right direction. Here we go. Every class I have, I show you the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. What's so exciting and why we're taking this pledge is as I mentioned, Florida Friendly Landscaping this year is 30 years old. Let's say, yay, happy birthday, Florida <laughs> Friendly Landscaping. So in 1993, uh, representatives of the University of Florida got together to um, come up with a program loosely based on xeriscaping, loosely based on that. Xeriscaping brings visions of rocks and cacti, you know, for good reason. Did you know, Dr. Lester, that the, the term xeriscaping in the whole program um, is owned by the city of Denver? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we think about, you know, good ideas, you know, um, keeping similar plants together, saving water for in Denver, that's of ultra importance, but not quite a tailored fit for Florida. <coughs> We're not in the West. We are in Florida, as we all know, which is very unique. It's its own place. So it deserves its own way of nurturing and protecting the environment. And they came up with these nine principles. They named them at the time in 1993, Florida Yards and Neighborhoods. And that kind of invoked the idea that no one is an island. What I do in my yard does affect my neighbors. It does affect my neighborhood. It does affect beyond my neighborhood. So we all need to, you know, all be good neighbors and good neighbors to the environment and work together. I think it was 09 when um, three different aspects of, they were all called under Florida friendly landscaping umbrella and three different aspects, homeowner, business and development, I think. I think so. Yeah, all came together to all be called Florida friendly landscaping. So, and um, I am the coordinator thereof for Hernando County Utilities. And these nine principles are something that has never changed. We have stayed with these nine principles. So what we're gonna cover today of course, right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, 
manage yard pests responsibly, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. There is an actual way, a website that you can go to. It's on this page here. Really, if you Googled Florida Friendly Landscaping Pledge, you're very likely to come up to, you know, have this website as a choice. So what do you do? Um, as we said, since 1993, it served as Florida's premier extension program, even though Dr. Lester is the horticulture agent working for the University of Florida. He's, you know, not really encouraged to go away from these nine principles. He's very much encouraged to work within them. These nine principles are kind of a basis for all of extension at UF. Isn't that true, Dr. Lester? Yes, it is. Yes. So it's um, alternatives to conventional landscaping, providing guidance on low impact. We like low impact, environmentally friendly, science-based landscaping practices that use less water and reduce pollutant loading to Florida waters. How can you join and you know make the pledge? You go to this website here and just remember, um, what I'm going to really be uh, talking about today is every every little bit, every little bit of bad we do <laughs> adds to pollution, adds to water issues. But every bit of good we do, if everyone did a little bit of good, there's going to be a lot of benefits. So I have worded these slides exactly as you will see them when you go to that website to make the pledge. I've worded the benefits they talk about too, exactly as you'll see them. Don't think you must, you know, click every one of those. Some of them might not even pertain to you. If you don't have a well, automatic irrigation system or something, you know, so much the better. But some of them you might just not be able to do. Maybe you're not able to have a compost bin or a rain barrel because of your HOA rules. Every one of these that you check, you've done something good for the environment and it still counts, you know, towards <clears throat> pledging to go Florida friendly. It's not an all <clears throat> or nothing program. It's a let's all do something. So I'm going to let Dr. Lester start us off with principle number one, right plant right place. Okay, this is where it all begins, is by choosing the correct plant and putting it in the correct spot. So as part of your pledge, it says, I'll match my plant's needs to my yard's conditions, helping them thrive with little or no irrigation, fertilizer, or pesticides once established. I'm going to avoid planting invasive species and try to remove the existing ones from my yard. That happens and we get a lot of questions from people who are new to the area. They just purchased a house and they're wondering, what are these trees in the back? Why are all these vines growing all over the back? Are they invasive? What are these plants? We can help you answer that and tell you if they're native or okay to grow or invasive and should be removed. And also it really helps to get a uh, soil test done before you start putting new plants in because some plants are very sensitive to what the soil pH is. So if your yard is blessed with a very high pH and you go to plant a whole row of azaleas, it's not gonna work out very well because azaleas need acidic soil. So we can help answer all those questions all the time. Next slide. So if you do all those things, some of the benefits are um, the plants mature to the desired size and they're gonna require less pruning. Always very important to keep in mind the mature size of your plant that you're installing. We see people sometimes make a mistake with palm trees or oak trees. They plant them right next to the front door. 20 years down the road, that oak tree is going to be a lot larger than it is today, you know, when you're putting it in the ground. So you have to keep that in mind. And then those plants, once they're established, they're going to require very limited amount of extra irrigation. I rarely have to irrigate anything at all in my yard. I do have a vegetable garden that I have to water, but as far as the lawn, the palm trees, bushes, things like that, 
they've all been in there for a number of years. I don't have to water them extra at all. And then plants that are planted in the correct soil type and pH are going to require fewer nutrient additives. So you're not going to have to fertilize as much or try to change the soil that you naturally, you know, were blessed with in your yard. If you plant pest resistant plants, it means you're going to have fewer applications of pesticides, fewer plant damage from insect pests, fewer problems. I really appreciate um, basically low maintenance or ideally no maintenance landscape material. And you can appreciate the landscape uh, always has an acceptable appearance. So it may not always necessarily be ready to go on the front cover of a gardening magazine. But it's always going to look pretty good. You're not going to have a whole lot of issues and problems with plants that you're going to have to tend to with either extra fertilizers, pesticides, or water. Now, to help you on your way to figure out, well, what kind of plants should I plant? What kind of plants fall into those categories? University of Florida and Florida Friendly Landscape Program has a book, uh, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. You, there is a web app. So you can go to this link and download the app and actually be able to pull things up on your phone and use it that way. You can download the entire book. You can, uh, if you go to the second link, that's a PDF version of the entire book. You can come to our office and we'll actually give you the physical book. Looks just like it does in the picture. We have them for free at our office. Uh, you can ask the uh, Florida Friendly Landscape office for a free copy. Or you can contact the Southwest Florida Water Management District, and they'll actually mail you a copy if you ask them nicely, which is still, I don't know how much longer they're going to keep doing that. That's got to get expensive with postage anymore, but they still do that right now. It's, and this still, is a on, great book. it's still on their website. That's where I got it from. So, so if, you, if, you, if you request today, they're going to send it to you. I can't guarantee they're going to be doing that forever, though. Uh, this is a really good book shows all the different Florida-friendly and native plants that are going to grow well in Florida. And it's broken up by area. So it's broken up by North Florida, Central Florida, and South Florida. So you can be looking at just plants that you know are going to perform well in your Central Florida garden. Next slide. So watering efficiently. You're going to pledge to water your plants or turf grass only when they show signs of drought. You will follow all the watering restrictions in my area, and you're going to calibrate that irrigation system to put down anywhere between one half and three quarters of an inch of water per watering event or per, per irrigation event. Next slide. So if you do those things, some of the benefits is that irrigation water is applied correctly, and it's going to be more accessible to your plants. So you're actually accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish with uh, outdoor landscape irrigation. Efficient irrigation means that you're going to use less water. I know that if you are on a well, you don't get a water bill. If you're not on a well, you get a water bill. So using water efficiently is going to result in a hope ideally smaller watering bill. If you are on Those a may decrease. If, right. if, if you are on a well, you still get an electric bill to use that. Yeah, yes. So you're still spending money to actually do that irrigation. It's not free. There is a cost involved. Mm -hmm. So if you do it correctly, your water bills may decrease or at least not increase, which is a good thing. You're going to be satisfied with your yard's appearance because you're adding the proper amount of water at the right time in the right spot. And there's going to be less water runoff and nutrient leaching from the site. So when you do have to apply fertilizer, which we're going to get to in a little bit, the fertilizer is going to actually get to the plants, to the turf grass where you want it to go. It's not going to just wash off and go down the sidewalk and down the gutter and into the nearest retention pond where we don't want it to go. Next slide. So here in Hernando County, if any of you live in another county other than Hernando, your rules will be different. So you need to check with your local authorities to find out what your watering rules are. But here for all of Hernando County, you're allowed to run your outdoor in-ground irrigation that waters your yard just once a week. 
and your day is determined by the last number in your street address. Uh, if you have any questions about this, there's the phone number for Hernando County Utilities Department, or you can just ask the question if you're watching this live at the very end, Lily can help answer those. This applies to everybody. So don't think, well, I have a well, so I can water whenever I want. No, you can't. You're bound by these rules also. So no matter where your water comes from, you're only allowed to irrigate your landscape, your yard, once a week. And the good thing is that's really all your yard needs. Don't think that, you, and, you know, unless you're trying to grow rice in your backyard, you're not going to have to apply 10 inches of water a week. Next slide. Fertilizing appropriately, another very, very important topic in all of Florida, but especially here in Hernando County. So what you're going to agree to in the pledge is that you're going to read and follow the instructions on the fertilizer labels, which is just common sense. You want to read the directions first before you go out there and start putting anything in your yard. You will apply the appropriate product at the right time and rate while following any local ordinances and restrictions. And there is a link to a uh, video class that Lily and I just did recently that explains in depth, point by point, Hernando County's new fertilizer rules. And they have changed recently. They've been updated and tweaked a little bit. So very important that you understand when you can fertilize your lawn. So now you may not apply any fertilizer to your lawn that contains nitrogen from December 15th to March 15th, that's, that's in the dead of winter. And then also from June 1st to September 30th, which is summer here in Central Florida. So you notice today is July 5th. So we are in one of those blackout periods right now. So here in Hernando County, you're not allowed to go out there and fertilize your lawn. And if you hire a service to do so, they are not allowed to put a fertilizer that contains nitrogen out there either. They've also expanded the uh, no fertilizer zone. So if you live in a spot that's right near water, that could be a river, a creek, a retention pond, a lake, whatever kind of body of water it might be, you cannot fertilize within 25 feet of that body of water or a wetland. So this may not apply to everybody, I know I live in the middle of Spring Hill. I'm not on a lake or a river or anything, but many people here in the county are. So what are some of the benefits of doing all those things and fertilizing properly? Your plant material is going to have the correct color and appearance. So you're going to be actually getting the correct fertilizer in the correct spot at the correct time of year to make your plants happy and achieve the results that you want to get. Your plants are going to flower and fruit appropriately. The groundwater and surface waters are protected from pollution. So here, if you fertilize incorrectly, the fertilizer can just wash right off. Looking at that picture, it can wash right off into the lake there. And that's going to cause a pollution problem. Even if you're not on a body of water, like I said, I'm in Spring Hill. If I apply fertilizers inappropriately, when it rains, the fertilizer is going to leach through my very, very sandy soil. And it's going to eventually end up down deep into the groundwater, and that causes pollution problems also. Your turf grass <coughs> is going to have adequate nutrients to grow appropriately, so all depending on the species. As a general rule, turf grass does not really require as much fertilizer as what a lot of people put down. Don't think that to have a nice looking lawn, you have to fertilize once a month, twice a month, year round. You don't have to. Uh, you may be more satisfied with the performance of the landscape plants and turf grass once you get on the right program and you're fertilizing appropriately. So a lot of important benefits from following those rules. Mulch, one of our favorite topics here and something that we could go into in depth for another hour or two. But mulch, mulching is very, very important and it's going to give you a lot of really um, practical benefits. So you're going to agree to maintaining a two to three inch layer of organic mulch in all your planting beds, and you will not use cypress mulch. And you're thinking, well, why not? It's on sale at the store. Cypress is a non-renewable resource. So um, cypress trees do not grow back as quickly as 
what they're doing with cutting them down and grinding them up. Pine bark mulch makes a very fine mulch and pine trees grow very quickly. They are very, very renewable. We grow a lot of pine trees here in the county and all over Florida. So you wanna use some kind of organic mulch and two to three inch layer, not two to three feet deep, just two or three inches. If you make it too thick, you're gonna cause more problems than what you're solving. Next slide. So some of the benefits is mulch reduces the germination of weeds. So you're gonna have fewer weeds in your flower beds and planting areas. That's always a good thing. Mulch is gonna help retain soil moisture. You're not gonna to have to water as much, even though you're only running the yard irrigation once a week, it's still gonna hold the moisture in for your plants, which is definite benefit. Makes your landscape look very, very nice. Gives it a finished appearance, as you can see from the picture here. Uh, that organic mulch is going to break down and decompose over time. So it helps to build up your soil and improve the soil structure. And then mulch moderates the soil temperatures. It helps to keep the soil cool when the temperature is hot and helps to keep it warm during the dead of winter when the temperature might get really, really cold overnight. So it helps to moderate the soil temperature and keep it where it should be. Next slide. Okay. And I think this is your topic. It is. I'm, I'm taking over here because number five is my favorite out of all of these principles. But you can't accomplish it without uh, adhering to all of the other principles too. Attract wildlife. And there's only really one thing you have to agree to on this one when you pledge that you will use plants and features that provide food, water, and shelter for pollinators, birds, and other wildlife. The next one um, well, that Dr. Lester will jump in and cover kind of pertains to this because um, if you want all these critters, first of all, if you want the birds to come, they're not going to survive or do well on just the commercial feed that you tr try to provide for them. You can have that, especially if you want to attract them to a very specific location where you can view them. But what they really need is plants that provide uh, food for them and they need protein. <laughs> this is the part that people get kind of hung up on. What are they gonna get the protein from? They're going to get the protein from insects. They're going to get protein possibly from some of maybe your beloved caterpillars. And you're going to say, whoa, I want the butterflies. You'll have the butterflies. But um, there's a reason that butterflies lay, you know, thousands and thousands of eggs. <laughs> because they're not all necessarily going to make it. And, so, you know, in the whole circle of life, sometimes maybe a caterpillar's purpose will have been to provide a great nutrient-rich soft meal for a baby bird. Um, don't interfere too much. That's what I'm saying. You know, if you want nature, let nature do its thing. Um, but you got to have insects. You And you have, if you want to have the things that need the insects to survive. Um, and as well as, you know, there was on one of the Facebook groups I saw, and people asked, you know, in the comments, are you actually kidding? But Bill and I have been around enough to know this person wasn't kidding. They said, what am I going to do about these caterpillars eating all of my dill? We've heard it about milkweed, too. That's what you have the butterfly plants there for. Yes, Bill, were you going to say something? No, you have to remember the butterflies come from caterpillars. Exactly. So you have to provide the correct food plants for the caterpillars. Right. If you want to eventually have them turn into butterflies that you can, you know, photograph and enjoy and sit out by your garden and have them flying around, just like in the picture here. Right. And I took that picture, by the way. I'm very proud of that one. Um, that's where a diversity, having this wonderful yard that has a diversity of different plants so that when a certain caterpillars come in and eat all of one certain plant, which is what you have it there for, 
your yard still looks good because there's something else that is not being eaten at that time, you know? So that wonderful diversity of plants, uh, food, wealth, water, and shelter as well. That's the different types of, again, that diversity, not only of plant species, but plant height, plant width, you know, different layers so that all the different wildlife um, can have sheltering places, hiding places, nesting places. And some people are against that type of thing because of one certain type of wildlife they may end up with. Well, you may, <laughs> you know, there may be some snakes in your, in your yard, it's Florida your know, wildlife friendly yard. As long as it's not a feminist snake, let it be, you know, because it's taking up a niche. And it's also helping, you know, with rodents or things that you may not want. The benefits of attracting wildlife, you and your community can observe various wildlife species. Increased habitat areas support Florida's wildlife. Everywhere we look, we see new development, don't we? So therefore, these wild areas are becoming less and less and less, except for the protected ones like our state or national forests or the wildlife corridor we got going through the state. But as I always say, every one of us wants development to stop as soon as our house is finished. <laughs> we are, you know, we're providing a lot of habitat for ourselves. And in so doing, we take away from this habitat for the wildlife. So really the best thing we can do is, it won't look the same as it did, you know, as a wooded lot, it won't fulfill the same function it did as a wooded undisturbed lot, but we can do something, something to try and mitigate that to bring some of those critters, make them feel welcome. Like, I'm sorry I destroyed your home, but let's work together so maybe we can live in harmony together. Um, wildlife may control certain landscape pests. As I said, you know, your black snakes are going to eat rats and, and other things that may bother you. Um, and even on the smaller level, you know, certain wasps, they're going to take care of uh, uh, aphids and thing, you know, when you spray too much pesticide and I'll let Dr. Lester get into this, you upset the balance and you kill off all of your allies along with your enemies. And he'll tell you who regenerates faster <laughs> when we get to that, that portion. So those beneficial insects are gonna help reduce pests and may help pollinate your flowers. So on that note, we will bring um, the one who minored in entomology back just for control pests responsibly, and then I will come back again. Sure. With, with controlling pests responsibly, what you're going to pledge to do is I will keep my plants healthy by scouting for pests in my yard regularly, which means you're going to go out there and actually look at your plants. You're going to catch problems early when they're much easier to deal with and cure and take care of. And probably the most important thing that you can do in this area, and it's not listed here, I don't think, is correctly identify what your problem is. I can't tell you how many times I see on different Facebook groups and pages, somebody will ask, what do I use, what do all of you use that's organic and safe, because everybody wants to use organic and safe things to kill bugs either in my house, on my plants, in my vegetable garden, wherever it might be. It's, well, what kind of bugs are we talking about? What kind of bugs are you having a problem with? It makes a difference. There is no magic thing that's gonna work on every problem you might have. Do you even have an insect? Maybe it's a disease, maybe it's an environmental problem, soil problem, pH problem. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong here. But the most important thing is you're going to go out there and actually look and check on a regular basis. And then I will use the least toxic methods of pest control first, the least toxic effective methods, and there are plenty of them to choose from, no matter what your problem is. 
and then I will spot treat or remove by hand pests that need to be managed. A lot of times you may have a plant, and I know this can happen with tomatoes, this can happen with a lot of different things. You might have one great big caterpillar on it eating the leaves. So are you gonna spray your entire yard? Probably not, you don't need to. You know, spray your entire garden? Don't really need to either because it's just one caterpillar that's causing your problem. You can take it off by hand. Some people I know are a little bit bothered by that. You can put on gloves or whatever. You can find a, a neighborhood child, pay them a quarter or something to pick it off. It can be removed physically and taken care of without even having to spray. So um, just treating and just spraying the areas you have to instead of constantly blanket spraying your entire piece of property. Next slide. So what this will do for you is it will protect populations of beneficial insects. Uh, it helps to keep pests under control. Everything out there, every insect out there eats something to stay alive and is eaten by somebody else. So if you really promote and protect ladybugs, ladybugs eat aphids, you're going to have a lot of ladybugs out there eating your aphids for you and keeping your problem under control. Don't think that every time you see a pest, you have to get in the middle of things and get involved. A lot of times you don't. A lot of times your beneficial insects will going to help to either solve the problem for you or keep it under control. Using the least toxic products first helps to protect the environment. Fewer problems with runoff and with pesticides getting in surface waters or groundwaters. Decreasing pesticide use on your property is healthier for your family, pets, the environment, your neighbors, your neighborhood. A lot of really good benefits there. And reducing chemical use saves money also. These things aren't free. And the prices on them have gone up over the last couple of years dramatically. Certain things, um, I know the price of fungicides are through the roof. So taking the correct steps to help reduce the amount of fungal problems you have in your lawn and garden is going to save you a lot of money. It's not like the good old days where you just run up to the store and for just a few bucks you get 20 jugs of different things to spray in your yard. Very expensive nowadays. Next slide. I think this is it, back to you. It is back to me. And I was thinking as you were speaking about, you know, not interfering. You know, you raised two boys. Did you jump in instantly when they would have, you know, little problems with each other? Or did you let them try and work it out first? No, you learn to let things go right. and let them manage themselves unless you need to get involved. Exactly. So and we should don't think that yard. you have to get involved in everything happening out in your yard. You can't sanitize the great outdoors. You really don't want to try because you're going to cause 10 times as many problems as what you may have right now to do that. Right. So in raising our kids, you know, you, you try to um, let them work things out amongst themselves, amongst the siblings, unless you have to get involved because that's the natural way they're going to have to learn how to deal with conflict resolution. Same thing is it's the natural way out in your yard <laughs> and take, you know, take a laissez-faire <laughs> attitude about your yard until it's time to step in. So number seven, number seven of nine, um, recycle, recycle yard waste specifically. So um, I will compost yard waste and this gives you a choice. This gives you a choice here because knowing that many communities may not allow you to compost your yard waste on site, especially with a bin, you know, like this beautiful bin that you can get from Hernando County, um, or recycle curbside. Um, that could mean, I think what they mean there is um, yard material. Recycle your yard material curbside so when as long as you know that you know when you put out I believe we have certain times in Hernando County that you can put out yard waste you're encouraged to and what that'll go into their um, you know big piles that actually do become composted over time 
So that is one way to do it. I just have never done it curbside because I have used it all in my yard. But, you know, maybe you're not allowed to. Either way, don't put it in your trash. That's that's the whole point. It doesn't make yeah. sense to do that. Or, and, and, or leave grass clippings on the lawn. You know, the, if you think about it, some of the most ridiculous things that we have done since the 1940s, really, is bag up. Okay, first of all, we're going to, we pay a lot of money to grow this crop, and this crop is this grass get in our yard. And so we pay, we bought, we bought it. We pay money to keep it alive by watering it. We pay to put chemicals on it so that we're we're tending to this crop, correct? And then it grows as crops will, and we harvest it, you know, and um, a lot of times in, in bags, in the lawnmower, which has a bag, which catches it. So therefore, up to this process, you know, you must be thinking, okay, or if aliens are looking down or something, they're thinking, okay, they're going to use this product they spent so much energy um, creating. Nope, dump it in the trash, throw it away. <laughs> yeah, what? So at least, um, and you're going to say it has value, it has aesthetic value. Okay, well, at least use those grass clippings back on your lawn. They do not cause thatch. University of Florida states that if you do that, you can skip two fertilizations a year. That's science from the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Hernando County now says that you can um, fertilize only in the spring and the fall. Well, that's your two other times you've got, you know, that you can fertilize and these grass clippings are gonna help you along with that process. Or I know what Bill's going to say, you use them in your vegetable garden, don't you? Yes, I do. So I bag the grass clippings and I either compost them or I use them as mulch in my vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. So yeah. either way, they don't leave the property. They stay on my property. And if you had put herbicides or things like that, then you would not use it, obviously, in your vegetable garden mm -hmm. or in your compost pile because some herbicides have a pretty long um, residual rate, which could show up later if you try to use that compost in planting beds or vegetable gardens. So that's only, that's best with untreated uh, lawn, lawn clippings. What are the benefits that you're gonna get from doing this? You're gonna have much less material that needs to be hauled away and much less of a carbon footprint much less um, space being used, you know, in our landfills, <clears throat> which we're going to pay for eventually. Um, the nutrients, as I said, are recycled and they stay on site. The, each clipping is 90% water, but it, the rest is, you know, that nitrogen and some minor others. So multiplied by the millions, it really does give back to the soil. Compost can provide a um, rich source of organic matter to add to landscape plantings. As Bill said, even your commercial companies right now under our ordinance are not allowed to apply turf fertilizer containing nitrogen to your lawn during this blackout period from June 1st to September 30th. Listen close to those words I said, containing nitrogen. We are finding more and more and more, and Bill and I are becoming more excited about using compost products to either put under a lawn before you ever even lay the sod, which is a great idea. But if it's too late for that, for what we call top dressing, which is basically sprinkling over just like you would fertilizer, using a compost. Well, what do you feel about using some type of compost product this summer in place of a nitrogen fertilizer, Bill? That's always a great idea, and that is allowed with the uh, fertilizer ordinance. So you are allowed to put down compost on top of your lawn, and especially if you have a uh, St. Augustine lawn, you can really see an impact. 
So if you begin doing that on a regular basis, your lawn will look better, grow better, has, oh, has a very positive impact on St. Augustine. And you might be getting a little confused right now because we're showing you a picture of some pretty rough compost. We're not telling yeah, you. Yeah, we're, we're talking about a completely finished compost. Yeah, we're talking about completely finished and even, um, uh, you know, commercially available compost, uh, composted mushroom. There's a product called Command with one M that I know at least one of the companies in Hernando County will provide, you know, will apply for you black cow even. Um, so we're not talking about putting big clumps of <laughs> unfinished compost smeared all over your yard. We're talking about, you know, a fine product in a bag and it will do great for your lawn in the summer months. But that, um, that rough product and pine straw can be used as a mulch in your flower beds, reducing the need um, to purchase. So, and what you're doing with your lawn and your flower beds and your vegetable gardens is you are continually building up that soil. You're adding microbes to that soil to make that soil more alive. <laughs> you are um, improving its nutrient holding and water holding capacity. The more often you do that, the great benefits there. Number eight is reducing stormwater runoff. So what you're gonna to pledge to do to reduce stormwater runoff, and most people, when they attend a rain barrel workshop, they have in their mind, I want to harvest this water so I can use it on my plants. Never walking in thinking, I'm here to reduce stormwater runoff, <laughs> but they're going to. They're going to do that 55 gallons at a time that, impervious surface that is your roof you know is you know a lot of water runs off of a lot of roofs especially the more development we get then going down you know impervious surfaces down the street ending up picking up pollutants on the way ending up in our waterways you know you want the rain barrel to harvest the water but you are also reducing stormwater runoff 55 gallons at a time or however many gallons you know your rain barrel is and again little by little if more and more people did that then that eventually will add up into the thousands of gallons of water that did not become stormwater runoff so you can pledge to keep rainwater in your yard rain barrel is not the only way to do it I tell people I want you to hoard the water that nature gives you. I don't know where it is right now. Do you, Bill? Where's the rain? We don't know what. what Not in my <laughs> yard, that's for sure. It's been yes. very, very dry here. It is supposed to be raining every day and it's not. And unfortunately, there's nothing Bill and I can do about that. It is the rainy season, but Florida kind of forgot. Maybe it's gonna remember soon <laughs> and maybe it'll last a little longer in the other way <laughs> um but for those who had rain barrels you know at least they have some water during these dry times that are supposed to be wet times but there are different ways of keeping water in your landscape you can have a rain garden and if you go to hernando county government youtube we have classes on that you can just send your downspouts to make sure that they go into a water bed instead of down the street. You can use more and more pervious materials, the more pervious materials that allows water to filter through and not go running off down the street, um, the better we all are. And of course, you can add a rain barrel to capture that rainwater for later use, or if you're very, very motivated, a, even a cistern. What are the benefits? Here's a picture of a rain garden. Not near as fancy as you may have been thinking in your head, but it fulfills a great function. What it does is it, whatever water may run off from your yard down through the neighborhood, it slows it down, it stops it, and then it lets it filter into the soil. 
while it's beautiful at the same time. I call them aquifer recharge gardens. Rain garden sounds prettier, but really what they are are aquifer recharge gardens. Most of the storm um, water is gonna remain on site and is filtered through the plants and the soil, reducing pollution coming from your landscape. Captured water in rain barrels can be used to irrigate landscape plants. Storm water management protects the landscape from erosion and your healthy landscape will protect the quality of Florida's waters. Even if the water coming from your landscape is pristine because you have zero chemicals in your landscape. First of all, no, it's not <laughs> because your roof isn't. <laughs> I'm sorry, your roof just isn't as, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. And we always forget it's also coming off the roof. But even if it, you know, is pristine when it left your landscape, it's going to pick up pollution on its journey to the lowest point, which is usually a waterway. So therefore, we want to keep it where we where it came to us. All of these other principles, when you sit down and really dissect these principles, they all exist to build up to number nine, protecting the waterfront. Um, I always talk about, you know, most of us have flown out of Tampa on an airplane. <laughs> and I ask people, when you are looking down, you're just flying out of Tampa. I'm not, don't look to the left. I'm not talking about the bay. Obviously the bay is there, but even on the right, headed north, what do you see, Dr. Lester, when you're flying out of Tampa? Nothing but little blue circles of water. Yeah, water, 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 more water. Florida's very, it's very Swiss cheesy and all those holes are filled with water. Even if you don't live on the water, any of us can take a eight minute walk and we'll find some body of water. Unfortunately, that proves true. It seems like when people go missing, you know, they end up in the water. Water is always close by. Florida is a very fragile environment. So it's up to all of us to protect that water, not only just if we live right on it. And my colleague, my mentor, Jim Mall from Pasco County reminds us we all live on the water because we all are on top of that aquifer. And it's our job to help protect it. But if you live in an especially fragile area where you are looking at a body of water from your breakfast nook, <laughs> what you're going to pledge here, most of the state, unless they also have different rules, is going to uh, create a 10-foot low-maintenance buffer along my waterway Well, I will not mow, use pesticides, or apply fertilizers. According to our updated fertilizer ordinance, that's 25 feet. Now, literally what it says is you will not fertilize within that 25 feet. And so what asks, what this you're pledging to do is um, you're not gonna fertilize or mow um, or use pesticides within 10 feet. Just remember, you're not gonna fertilize within 25. So that helps prevent erosion. It helps, uh, you know, not mowing there and putting native plants there helps with the um, the wildlife that's on that barrier between land and water. It does a lot of good things. And as you can see, this is a gated community, this picture here, and it does not look unattractive. You don't have to have turf, <clears throat> you know, where turf ends, water begins. <clears throat> it's very beneficial to have a buffer in between there. So the benefits that you're going to have of protecting the waterfront is the low maintenance zone, means less mowing, maybe less cost if you pay someone to do that. You will, this says May, I think you will see increased wildlife activity um, with the addition of these shoreline plants. Flood tolerant plants along the water's edge are known to help reduce contaminants in the water. They're gonna help filter it out. You know, if something, found its way down the street through your lawn 
<clears throat> maybe it'll be filtered out by those shoreline plants before it gets in the water. And it's also the diversity of flowering and other plants enhances the beauty of the waterfront. If we protect our waterfront, we are also protecting ourselves economically. Because who wants to come to Florida to see ugly, polluted water? Not to mention that it is better for our health and better for the, the you know, health of the environment. So those are the things that you can easy peasy, lemon squeezy, go online and um, we'll show you the, um, the website again, but you can also just go Florida Friendly Landscaping Pledge. Google will help you find that. But if you're really excited about this, please still go pledge and make sure when you're there, you mark that you're from Hernando County <laughs> because they also have a little graph that shows you how many people from each county, you know, have pledged. And Bill and I would like to see the numbers rise in Hernando County. We wanna see an exponential rise in Hernando County numbers so that they call and say, whoa, what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, that we're getting really people, people really excited about pledging. But let's say you are really excited and you think, not my yard, I've, I've pledged yes to all of those things or most of them, and I wanna do more. I want my yard recognized for the great things I do. At this moment, there is still, um, you can still get your yard certified as Florida friendly. We've kind of heard that might be changing over time, but it's still available on the website. So it's still occurring. And this is much more intense of a process than this pledging that we just talked about. And there is a checklist. So again, when you go and find the pledge, you will be on the website. And if you look under FFL and U, and then yard recognition, the first step would you do would be to download that checklist and make sure that you're following it all and see if there's something you need to change. And then contact, um, the Florida friendly um, office in your county. Give it some time before you contact the one here in Hernando <laughs> County. Go over that checklist first and um, you know, make sure your yard's in great shape before you call or that your yard follows all the rules. And maybe it doesn't follow one that's pretty major. Like maybe you just, you know, I'm gonna grow this, you know this Mexican petunia and you're not going to stop me. Well, okay, <laughs> but you know, you're not a candidate for a certified yard, but you said yes to some of these other things. So that would help you um, filter it out, whether you want that or not. This is a master gardener of Bill's. She had her yard certified. She lives in a gated community. And you can see she has turf. We're not saying you can't have turf. It's, it's all in how you care for things and it's all in right plant right place, right care. Number one rule, let me get this out of the way right now, <laughs> to have a yard certified, is your yard has to conform to the aesthetics of your community <laughs> and follow your HOA rules. So it cannot be used as a way to get out of your HOA rules, but you can still have a Florida friendly yard and stay within what you signed up to do when you joined, you know, that community. So um, I would email, and I will show you the email address again, the Florida Friendly email, if you want to follow up with that. Now I've been doing this job for nine years, nine principles, nine years. I've added, these are not uh, official by the way, <laughs> but these are Lily's added landscaping principles. Lily's landscaping principles that she's added to the nine. And my number one is take care of the gardener, especially right now, it's been a little warm. It's been obscenely hot actually <laughs> out there. And so we love plants, we love the environment. 
but there's nothing happening in your yard, you know, that can't wait. You are a bit more important to your family than your yard. And many of you, ourselves included, are not 20. <laughs> And our bodies may not respond like they did when we were 20. So I want you to take care of the gardener. Florida's a hot, hot, hot place in the summer. It can damage your health greatly. So, you know, just be careful. Work in the early morning or the evening. I say by 10 o'clock, get inside. <laughs> Certainly by 11. Wear mosquito repellent because you're I'm telling you to be out when mosquito control is telling you not to be out, but it's too hot in the middle of the day. Drink, we're in water conservation, but the one place I want you to put that water is in your body. Follow the shade. What do I mean by that? When you go out in the morning to work, start in the shade, wherever the shade keeps moving to, that's where you're working. Follow you know, the pattern of the shade. Don't be out in the bright sun and wear loose, light colored clothing. Take breaks. If you got a pool, jump in it. And then, you know, start to work some more or at least go inside in the air conditioning, cool off, wear sunscreen, wear a hat. Please take care of the gardener, especially during these very hot times. My other principle, and I've been talking about that, every little bit counts. These pledges, you don't have to pledge every one of them. If every one of us did some, that is going to be a huge benefit to our environment. This yard here didn't start out looking like this. It probably started out 100% sod. I think this might be um, the one in the villages, Dr. Lester, that turned 100% native. I think this might be uh, Stephen Turnipseed's yard. And now- I'm not sure it might be. Yeah, and now he doesn't even have that little splotch of sod in the middle. Step by step by step by step. You have time. And, you know, as long as you have something to do, some project, you're going to have to stay here on Earth to do it. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a benefit for everyone. And my uh, principle is also embrace imperfection. Is it ever going to be perfect, Dr. Lester? Probably not. No. And I've kind of changed, you know, another saying, but I'm going to say let go and let garden. Meaning let the garden do what the garden does. We were talking about that with pest control and attracting wildlife and stepping back and letting, just let go and let garden. <laughs> Before you step in and think you have to, because we are wired to control. And that might be one of the great things about gardening is it teaches us we don't have control, <laughs> you know, and let nature, let the garden do what the garden does within reason, of course. Don't let invasive plants take over your whole yard. But when we're talking about the wildflowers and the native flowers and the birds and the bees and the butterflies, you know, tie your hands up. <laughs> Sit and enjoy what needs to be done. If you have to do something, go pull some weeds, you know, with your hands. <laughs> so that, you know, is one of the least harmless, you know, least harmful things you can do. But you're never going to have it perfect. Use it as a Zen area. Find your patience. Embrace that imperfection. And the last of my principles is have fun. If we're not having fun, what are we doing it for? You know, most of us can, could probably pay someone or just have a lawn and pay someone to mow it and never think about it again. We do it because we love it. So let's have fun while we're doing it and not stress ourselves out over it. So <laughs> I think we've gotten at the end of, yeah, it's 11 o'clock. So here are some resources. Again, this is where you can find the pledge. ffl.ifis.ufl.edu. Just go there. You can fill in the about and FFL pledge, but you can also find it. 
you know, through navigating through the page. If you want to go and you're, you know, do it now so you don't lose the excitement about um, taking that pledge. And here are some other resources. There's where you can find the plant guide. Florida Friendly Landscaping has tons of resources. We have a ton of videos on Hernando County Government YouTube. Go to YouTube, put in Hernando County Government, look for Florida Friendly Landscaping playlist, look for Hernando Extension playlist. We guarantee you that will keep you busy the rest of the summer and you won't have to go outside where it's hot. <laughs> and you'll be already in the fall by that point. This is where Dr. Lester's office is. If you wanna stop in, Thursdays is the best time between nine and three. You'll find Master Gardener yeah. Bernie, who is available to sit and talk and he is so knowledgeable and he can help you. Or if you can't make it there, give him a call. There's the phone number 352-754-4433. Great place to stop. You may not catch Dr. Lester there. It's easier to find him through email, but you will find Bernie. You will find Teresa, who's a huge help. You will find those books that we referred to. And there again, they're free. So, and if you're not listening from Hernando, then find your county extension office. They should be able to help you the same way. We have Facebooks. We have YouTube. We have multiple ways of staying in contact. Having said that, now here's the hard part. <laughs> here's the part I've been avoiding. Um, Friday is my last day. I will be retiring. I think we made the announcement at the last virtual plant clinic. I will be with Bill tomorrow on the virtual plant clinic at 10 a.m. You can find that link on Hernando Extension Facebook page, or many of you already know how you get on. But um, as I said, I've been doing this for nine years and my husband and I are gonna take a new adventure. I'm retiring early so I can spend time with him traveling the country. Here's some pictures of the great times I've had, you know, with this job, by far the best job I've ever had and have got to deal with the best people and especially those whom we get to uh, talk to and teach. And, you know, anyone who's told me that little bit, they've done a little bit to make a difference, then I know this has all been worth it. And so, you know, I need to thank Dr. Lester sitting there, who has been a great partner from the first time we got together. We had zero issues <laughs> getting along. They work really well together. So here we are down here learning stuff at the university. <laughs> and um, it's been a great ride. And I'm not sure exactly, you know, we're going to be traveling. But I don't know. I, I have about 50 different ideas of different things I would like to do. We will be centered. We, buy, we bought a little home actually in Pennsylvania. So I have great new things to learn there about gardening there. But I'll be here in the winter. <laughs> we're, we'll, we'll be staying in our RV down here in the winter. This is my boss who hired me. So I have to thank Alice, um, you know, for giving me the chance <laughs> to do this job. For all her work and life advice, we spend a lot of time in meetings <laughs> in her office. Um, and she has really given me the room to make this job what I've been able to do, you know. She's trusted me so that I can do the best job I can do and I can bring the best programming to the county. I have an absolutely humongous family and it's a goal of hers to try and keep up with all of them. Bill doesn't, <laughs> so. There's just too many of them. You know, <laughs> you know everybody in the county, I think. Yes. And uh, so she listens to all those stories. She she can she knows most of them by name and how they're related to me and what they do. She she's very good at that. And uh, you know she's just been a very very good friend, even before I had the job. And she'll continue to be after. These videos would not exist 
without a person putting them on Facebook. This is the man behind the, zine, the scenes, the man behind the YouTube. John Cancel works with Hernando County Public Information. I send him these videos. He gets them up on YouTube. Lickety split. And, you know, is a very positive and, you know, great person to work with. So I have to show my appreciation to the man behind the YouTube too. Bill likes to, you know, tease me that John does stuff for him before he does stuff for me. But so now you'll get them all to yourself for a little while. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone for allowing me to be part of your gardening journey, part of your Florida friendly landscaping journey. And I think I'll be popping up here and there. Probably haven't seen the last of me. So. We'll be sure to have you back as a guest on a regular basis. And we will be continuing with these kind of classes and all of our programming. We're going to have to do our best to try to find somebody to take over for Lily. I didn't want to say replace her because there's no replacing her, but somebody else to kind of carry on and put their stamp on the program. They will, so, yes. So we're, we're still here. <laughs> Dr. Lester is still here. He hasn't gone anywhere. Florida Friendly Landscaping, as I mentioned, the program, it's the basis for all of the horticulture program on UF, in UF. So it hasn't gone anywhere. These principles, these principles over here, um, they're still going to be around. And also, yes, they are working on the interview process. So there's going to be a little bit of a lag between us. Because if you say interview someone today who has to give two weeks, you know, there's going to be some time. I'd say two weeks minimum, possibly a month, possibly longer, depending how the whole thing goes. Bill and the Master Gardeners will do a great job of filling in in the meantime. But whomever comes... They're not going to be me. They're going to be them. And they're going to, like he said, put their own stamp on it. And I fully trust that they will do a wonderful job as well. So thank you everyone for, again, allowing me to be part of your journey. And I just want everyone out there to have a wonderful Florida friendly life. And thank you, Dr. Bill. Thank you, Lily.